Hello, everybody. It is Tuesday, the 23rd of July, 2013. I'm Rene Ritchie, and right now we're going to talk about Apple's Q3 2013 financial results. This is an impromptu I'm More Show. Joining me right now is Mobile Nation's own financial guru, Chris Umiostowski. How are you doing, Chris? I am doing great, Renee. How are you? Good. It's awesome. I know Kevin usually hogs you for the Crackberry financial call, so it's great that I can <laughs> grab you for this one. Yeah, why not? Let's do it. So um, Apple today, they announced their results. Now, uh, just to preface this, it's a weird time for Apple because last year at this time, they'd announced a new iPad 3, the first Retina iPad. They'd announced the Apple TV 3, the first 1080p um, iPad, and they basically had product um, that would sell through for the remainder of the year. This year, until WWDC in June, they hadn't announced anything, and at WWDC, all they announced were new MacBooks and new um, airports, and I'm not even sure how much those contributed to the quarter. So it was a very strange quarter for Apple, just year over year and even sequentially. Yeah, it does seem that way. I mean, um, we were talking about this a little bit during the conference call even, that you know, they, they have really altered their product cycles, and so it's kind of screwing up the year over year comparisons, and uh, even the quarter over quarter comparisons. Yeah, so what Apple reported uh, was around 35 billion in revenue and close to 7 billion in profit. Now, uh, just to explain to people how Wall Street works a little bit, Chris, they don't seem to care about how much money you're making today. They seem to care about what they think you might make in some abstract future. Is that right? Well, yeah, I mean, everything is supposed to be forward looking, and, and that's true that usually it doesn't come down to how a company did on the quarter that they're reporting. It comes down to the guidance for the future periods. And Wall Street's very myopic, so what they tend to do is look at next quarter. Now, that said, if a company has like a really big beat or a really big miss in the current quarter, then what happens is people start going, well, you know, things are way better than management said or things are way worse than management said and that tends to amplify things if that makes sense. Yeah, I mean, it, it doesn't make sense, which I think is the problem, because just as an average person, we see Apple making money hand over fist, but, you know, they're doomed and their stock tanks, where Amazon, who deliberately never turns a profit, is trading at such a high, almost factorially, to what, to what they're producing, and that sort of creates a bit of a disconnect in mainstream people, I think. Yeah, well, I mean, okay, so there's two issues there, right? The first one is the company versus the stock market. So we see, uh, you know, as general consumers, we, we can look at the press release and say, wow, I mean, Apple is making billions <laughs> of dollars. Look at how much cash they have. Look at the 31.2 million iPhones they sold. Clearly, this is a company that's not in any trouble at all. And then there's Wall Street and the, well, the whole financial world, it, and, and you have to put a price on that. So what's that worth? And that's what Wall Street's job is, right? Or any investor really is. Well, what is it? What is it? What should this business be worth, given how much they're making, how much I think they're going to make? And the big issue, of course, right now with Apple is they don't seem to have any earnings growth. They're they're in fact they're in a period of earnings decline. It's not a big decline, and obviously to to your point about product cycles, they I think it's quite likely things will come back when they have another product cycle. Um, but that's the big challenge. What do you pay for a business that was once growing fast and is no longer growing nearly as quickly? In fact, not at all right now. Yeah, which again, I hearken back to Amazon, which doesn't make any yeah. money, but is, uh, anyway, I'm not going to harp on that too much. Yeah, and then, and then the, so the second issue that I said I would mention, so first is what do you pay? The second is the law of comparison, right? So people are always comparing you to what you did before. Mm -hmm. And in the case of Amazon, they've never really made a lot of money because they have always been in perpetual investment mode. And, you know, the stock's actually done remarkably well over the last, you know, 10 or so years or however long they've, they've been around. I can't remember when they IPO'd. Um, but, you know, they've always been in investment mode. And for the foreseeable future, they will continue to be in investment mode. Whereas a, a company of Apple's size, people expect cash flow and profit growth, and they, people treat them like they're much more of a mature company than Amazon is. 
they seem to expect a new product like an iPhone every year. I mean, I, the minute the I, they were expecting the iPhone, the minute it came out, they were expecting the iPad. The minute that came out, it's like, where's the TV? Where's the watch? Where's everything? Yeah, else? exactly. And you know that that gets a little silly when you know when the price earnings ratio of the stock. So in other words, what the stock is trading at versus its annual earnings. Um, when their ratio is very low, they don't need to invent another iPad or iPhone type of product line. They just need to do some decent growth. Or in fact, in some cases, like you look at their valuation and say, these guys could pretty much never grow again above the GDP and they will still be undervalued. Yeah, uh, and, that's absolutely uh, true. <laughs> so so uh, let's get to the nitty gritty now. They announced 31.2 million iPhones sold, which was 20% up from last year and yeah. way ahead of expectations. Yeah, I think tw I think it was a 26 million uh, estimate forecast, right? Yeah. Or estimate for redundancy. Department of Redundancy Police can attack me on that one. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the forecast was 26 million, as far as I remember, from from. Uh, it was Conservative. all over the map, but it, this was higher than what almost everyone predicted. Yeah, it was a lot higher. Um, and then, of course, everything else was a well. Yeah. Not a well, huge before miss, I get to that, else seemed to disappoint. They see they seem to do two things. They were first the average um, the average revenue for the iPhone was down, um, and Apple was very consistent in what they said. They beat these talking points to death almost. iPhone yeah. 5 is the most popular, but people are happy with the iPhone 4S and the iPhone 4 as well. And the iPhone 4 is exploding, especially for first-time smartphone buyers and for emerging markets. Yeah, exactly. And you know what? The, the, uh, the ASP doesn't really bother me at all. I mean, if you look at a chart, I think, um, I think it was Business Insider who put together you know, a, a nice chart of all this, showing the quarter-by-quarter -quarter moves. But of course, the you know the the y-axis intercepts the x-axis at like five hundred and something dollars. Yeah. So you see these humongous swings that look like they're just enormous, and really they're just a few dollars. And so the, the ASP is down five percent. Yeah, I think it is uh, quarter over quarter five percent or something like that. Yeah. And um, four percent year over year. So if you look at it on a year over year basis. Being down by four percent, it just doesn't. It's a tech stock. This doesn't bother me. But what's interesting is that the narrative leading up to this, and what people keep using to frame Apple's future, is that the high-end smartphone market is saturated, saturated, and that it's causing, it's going to cause Apple problems. But the iPhone was up fifty per, fifty-one percent increase in the United in States. The US. Yeah. Yeah, that's remarkable. Um, and Tim specifically said, I do not believe that we are at a peak for the high-end smartphone. I don't know what his exact wording was, but that's what he said. He said, I don't believe we peaked here. Yeah, and a mix of new products and new features is what Apple always sees as a way to, to combat the inertia yeah. of past products. Yeah, and if you know, like you look at what's going on, I think it was IDC numbers yesterday that came out. It might have been another firm, but the average smartphone price is now three hundred and seventy-five dollars, down from four hundred and something a year ago, whatever it was. And you know, this is uh, to me, this is obvious mixed shift math. Like when the dumb phone is dying and yeah. the world is migrating towards smartphones. Obviously, a lot of that migration is happening at the lower end of the market, so obviously it's going to pull the average smartphone price down because if you take it to its limit, all phones will be smartphones, and they certainly won't be selling for an average of $375. No, I mean, that's absolutely true, and Tim Cook broke it down into several things. He said that the key catalysts for driving ongoing sales are going to be new distribution opportunities, new carrier yes. relationships, expanding yeah, retail online and indirect. Yeah, yeah, that's. I was really interested in this. In fact, I wrote down like when he said carrier relationships. I thought, okay, so you know maybe 2000 and thir late 13 or early fiscal 14 for that. Maybe maybe it's time that they do a deal with China Mobile finally. Uh, you know, there's still all of this to come, right? I want to get to China Mobile specifically in a second. But what he said that interests me, especially with you on the podcast, is that Apple is owning about 60% on average in the enterprise. And obviously, it's much higher for iPad than it is for iPhone in tablets versus smartphones. But he thinks there's room to drive that growth as well. And enterprise has been anything but a traditional market for Apple. Yeah, and they, I know like just 
through through some of the activities that I've seen happen, people that have left BlackBerry, hiring that these guys have done. I know um, a few years ago they hired a key guy from Microsoft who was in charge of a lot of the enterprise stuff. So they've been building this up slowly. And I think the stat they gave was in terms of activations on good technologies product, right? Yes. And so that's a pretty good proxy for a like a non let's say an enterprise that does not use BlackBerry Enterprise Server, which would be kind of the obvious big boy in, the, in that market. So for the non-BlackBerry users or for those who have expanded to more than just BlackBerry, yeah, I think, I think that the whole BYOD market has caused this to happen. It'll be interesting to see because BlackBerry is busy. They're, as Kevin keeps saying, transitioning from vertical to horizontal, and part of that is BlackBerry Enterprise Server for all devices. And I don't know if they've put out any numbers yet or if they will put out numbers, but interesting to see what iOS does in that mix. Yeah, I imagine it'll do quite well because um, obviously people want to bring their iPhones in to work and hook them up to the work infrastructure and you know use the device of their choice. Like this is a world where is clearly, and it happened, I'll admit it happened way faster than I thought it would, Renee, but this is a world now dominated by what the employee wants, not what the IT department wants. Yeah, I mean, that was the brilliance almost of this strategy is that Apple never had any luck penetrating IT because, you know, no one ever got fired for buying Microsoft or BlackBerry yeah, and they bought course, based on yeah. checklists. And they did a complete end run around that and assaulted them from their consumer base. Pretty much, yeah. They made the, they made the employees do the work for them or they allowed the employees to do the work for them is probably a better way to frame it. And uh, and now, yeah, like you look at everything that's happening, you know, things are moving into the cloud. You've got uh, BYOD happening at work. It's, it's almost like they don't need to worry about the fact that Microsoft has the OS <laughs> at yeah. most enterprises. Who cares? They'll, they'll steal what they can of everything else. Okay, I want to go back to China because I know you've been following China closely and while the US, Japan, the UK and some other places did well for Apple, China was down. Mainland China was up slightly, but Hong Kong was down enough that it dragged greater China down. Yeah. And, and Cook said that they didn't quite understand why that was happening yet. Yeah, I think, um, like, I, I, for example, I remember just last week I was talking with Ed Zabitsky about tech stocks in general. Um, of course, people listening may remember Ed from our Stock Talk podcast, and he's the founder of uh, ACI Research. One of the smartest guys I know in terms of not only tech, but how he looks at the macro environment. And I am not a macro guy. I, it bores me to tears to study anything about the macro economy, so don't take this from me. But I know his view was the economy is suffering right now from, on a, at a macro level, so it isn't going to be surprising to me if I have a phone call with him tomorrow and he says, you know what, I think Apple's having a hard time in China, mainly because China's economy is slowing. And so that, you know, if that's the case, there's nothing anyone can really do about that, but wait. And then in Tim, that would probably justify why Tim Cook is saying the things he's saying. Like, you've got to look at where China was several years ago compared to where it is now, and you've got to take a long-term perspective on China and not worry about 90 days. No, I think that's absolutely true. And I think what was interesting before we get to the iPad numbers is that the iPod got skipped entirely in the press release yeah. and in the conference call. I, mean, I don't recall them mentioning iPod in the conference call. You had to go to uh, the SEC filing to find out that they sold uh, 4.6 million iPods, which was down 2.2 million uh, units. And I, I find that interesting because... A lot of companies cling to what made them successful in the past. I mean, Microsoft has shown that you can hold on to Windows well past its, you know, m the height of its market. But Apple, while iPod was going down, they already introduced iPhone. And now they've kind of, I wouldn't be surprised if iPad mini cut into the iPod touch market because you can have a cheap device with a bigger screen. Oh, that's a really good point because, um, like, I, you know, I'm probably due for an iPad upgrade at some point. And... I'm pretty sure it's going to be an iPad mini for me just because of the portability. And, you know, my wife's got an iPod Touch, fifth gen, and I, I can imagine that she would probably much rather have the iPad mini as well because it's not that much bigger. And it's an interesting space for Apple because before they were entirely dependent on the Mac market, and while they made a lot of money on Macs, their percentage of the market was so small and their business was so vulnerable. But then the, they went into iPods, which 
you know, was crazy, a music player, but the iPod revenue shot past the Mac, and then as the iPod started going down, iPhone revenue shot up, and now iPhone dips, iPad comes up, iPad dips, iPhone comes up, and as an overall business, it seems having all these legs, like, like they call them, has made them much more resilient to the ups and downs of their product cycles. Definitely, definitely makes a lot of sense to me, and it's, you know, I, I am just so... I'm so impressed with the use cases for tablets that I just, I don't think that that product has run its course yet. I think there's a lot more growth to come. Uh, I think that's absolutely true. And I think that, again, there was no new iPad this spring like there was a new iPad last um last year, but they still managed to sell 14.6 million iPads. They did not break down iPad mini versus iPad, but it sounds like iPad mini is doing really well, but that also seems to put pressure on their margins. Yeah, and that's, you know what, I think that's a fact of life when you are dominant at the top end of the market, and we whether we're at the peak in, um, you know, high-priced electronic products like this or not. I think we're closer to a peak on iPhone than we are on iPad. Um, but when you get there, you do need to introduce a lower cost product at some point. Which is what they did with the iPod business, right? They did the iPod Nano yeah. and people thought they were crazy and then they did the shuffle. People thought they were even crazier because suddenly you have a $50 iPod on the market. Yeah, I mean like, you know, I don't, I can't think of any premium priced product companies in the world that don't have at least some variation in pricing. You know, like you look at high-end car companies, they've got higher and highest, you know? Yeah. <laughs> they, they all have at least some range, except for right now you've got young companies like Tesla. They've got, you know, a sedan and kind of that's it. Even them, they have a performance model and a, you know, a regular model, so. Yeah, it's I think common it you have sense. the one that you want but can't afford, the one that everyone buys and the cheap one that no one gets but is on the market to get you in the door. Yeah, and so and then even with Apple, like Apple in every category of every product that they have pretty much ever shipped, I'm exaggerating, but whatever, they have a range of products, yeah. right? And so iPhone is the only one where the range is based on time domain. It's based on the past and not a rollout of, you know, a series of products. Now, there are rumors of a low-cost iPhone, and to me, that kind of helps Apple in three ways, because first, it does make a lower-cost model for emerging markets and, you know, for places in the U.S., for people who don't want high-end smartphones, but it also takes the pressure off the high-end, because this year, presumably, under the same strategy, the iPhone 5 drops $100, and the iPhone 4S drops $100, and then those devices are so good that people who might otherwise buy the new iPhone, the 5S, would consider a 5 instead, but by making a low-cost budget iPhone, um, the same way they made lower, you know, the I, they have the iPod touches that are cheaper, they have the iPad mini, which is cheaper, it yeah. takes pressure off their high end as well. And that, you know, maybe, Renee, maybe that's the answer. Maybe they do not need to come out with um, a, a range of products in price all at once until the next iPhone isn't a material step up. Like the iPhone 5, I think, you know, they had a lot of differentiators in there. They had LTE in there. It was, they had a, an increase in screen size that a lot of people really enjoy. Um, it's a much better phone. When that stops becoming as noticeable as it is, at least to me, and I know not everybody feels the same way, then maybe that's when you, you know, you don't just put the one generation old phone on a discount, but you get rid of them all, and you introduce a tier of product prices right there. Which is also nice because it normalizes their market because theoretically this cheaper iPhone would have a 4-inch display and a lightning connector, and that gets the 3.5-inch display with the 30-pin dock connector off the market entirely, much yeah. faster than evolution would otherwise allow. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. So going so back to the iPod... Yeah, they didn't break out iPod sales um, unit volume, at least. that doesn't. I guess that doesn't surprise me because more and more people are going to buy these things as part of the phone. It just makes sense that things would go that way. Um, it's not a big driver of their business anymore, right? One of the things that interested me, because I don't understand this anywhere nearly as well as you do, is that they were very careful to hedge on the iPad numbers, saying that uh, they were down, they said it was a tough comparison because of a 1.9 million channel inventory switch, so really yeah. it was only a 3% uh, change year over exactly. year. Yeah, yeah, you want me to talk about that at all? Yeah, if you could explain just basically what that means. Yeah, so all that means is that 
in the comparable quarter, whenever you hear a company say comparable quarter, there or a tougher comp, it's usually the street lingo is a tough comp. We had a tough comp, as in a tough comparison to the year ago quarter. So Q, this sorry, this was their Q3, right? So their Q3 in 2012, they had just introduced the third gen iPad. They were building channel inventory. Remember that they book revenue based on what they ship. In. This is standard practice when somebody else takes title of the product, that's one of the keys for revenue recognition. So you get to recognize the revenue when the carrier or whoever the distributor is takes that product from you. And so it hasn't sold through to end customers yet. It's on the shelves or it's in transit or whatever. And in that quarter, they recognized revenue on a lot of iPads that were going in to build up that inventory. Whereas the exact opposite is happening now. What's, what you've got going on is there hasn't been a new iPad in a while. So there's, an, um, there's a bleeding happening of inventory. So they sold into the channel less iPads than the channel actually sold to consumers, which means that the inventory, or if you want to think of it as you know what's left on the, the shelves in Walmart or Best Buy or Future Shop, whatever store you feel like choosing, um, there's less of it. So in terms of what... What matters in terms of uh, judging the health of a business? How much of this stuff people are actually buying? Who cares about the carriers and all that? How about you and me and our kids and our wives and who's buying what? And that's only down 3%. That's their logic. And so being down 3% when they didn't have a product to actually, you know, talk about up on. isn't re it, it's sort of like, eh, whatever. It's, it's a flat business because, you know, there's no new model. And, and that's what, I mean, some people have said that's what makes it hard for people to understand Apple is that because their business, because they're so quiet about their business, because they control so much of it end to end, they can have these incredibly different product cycles where one year, you know, they have a major release every three months and the other year they have a major release you know, every 12 months. And that yeah. makes it very hard to look at it in terms of a, a, sta a steady business rate. Yeah. And I mean, it, it's, um, which is probably a good sign. If, if this was so easy to look at, it would probably tell us that this is a pretty mature company. And so I think the fact that they there is still so much change based on when a new product comes out is an obvious indicator that this company is still doing stuff that the consumer market loves. And, you know, you put a new product and, wow, you get everybody talking about it. Uh, to me, that's a good sign. You know, the Macs were also down 7% decline, but higher than Apple's expectations. And they said the market for PCs was down 11%, down 11. so the Mac is still growing. Yeah, so they gained share again. And that's, you know, their typical argument when there's a weak quarter on Mac. But, uh, you know, the more and more I think about it, again, not being a macroeconomy guy, if if kind of sales are down everywhere, in including, you know, it's hitting Apple, the world's biggest tech company, we probably are just, you know, experiencing a slowdown in the global economy for now. And uh, in in the grand scheme of things, Apple's still doing okay. And what's interesting to me, and going back to your Stock Talk podcast and Ed, is that you guys were always upbeat about HTML5 applications and their potential for the future. And Apple yeah, even we talked were. about That's it right. here. No, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. They talked about iWork in the cloud, which is a complete HTML5 version of iWork. Looks fantastic. Will run on a PC or, I guess, a Linux box if you have a compatible browser. Yeah, pretty. It, I mean, it's definitely happening, right? But I think, I think HTML5 is shaping up to supplement a lot of the a lot of the apps that would normally run on your computer in many ways. And um, when it comes to mobile, it seems like the the in in the case of Apple, at least. I mean, we've got such a powerful SDK. We've got such a rich ecosystem of developers who know how to use this stuff. And native is just native is better if it's not tremendously expensive to do it in native, and uh, and so a lot of the of course you know any really big app by a big company there's going to be a big budget behind it you may as well go native. Yeah, well, I mean, if you look at iTunes on Windows, it's horrible. And I think it makes sense for Apple because it saves them money and lets them service basically every other non OS 10 or iOS machine all at once. It solves two problems for them. Yeah. Yeah, it really does. That makes a, a ton of sense. So um, that's, you know, if you can get, I guess if, if you can get people using more Apple stuff, whether it's, you know, numbers or keynote, I guess keynote in the cloud will probably be the big driver because a yeah. lot of people do presentations, right? So if you've got a nice, you know, and key, I mean, 
I love Keynote compared to PowerPoint. I have personally switched over entirely. I do not use Excel anymore unless I have to. I do not use PowerPoint ever, and I don't use Microsoft Word. I use Pages. Mm -hmm. And so if you give me those in the cloud, I think it just makes it even more compelling. They're easy products to use. They work really well. And, um, you know, God, they're cheap already on, on the Mac OS. They're like 10 bucks a piece, right? So what are they going to cost in iCloud? Are and, they gonna well, they're going to be free, I think. And there's a rumor yeah, that all of, I mean, of iWork will be free. That, you know, that makes things pretty easy, right? So, and of course, they'll synchronize beautifully over to your iPad, which is probably where most people will use them in terms of the, the mobile environment. I don't think people are going to look at a lot of these things. On, I, don't, I just can't see people doing word processing or spreadsheets or any of that stuff on an iPhone. But on an iPad, absolutely. In a meeting, absolutely. So could you get some more SMBs to start moving over to these you know, Mac platforms? You're not going to get the big corporations to move. Or anyone who needs soon. collaboration like Google Docs. Yeah, actually, yeah, that would. Be, I mean, I'm sure they can introduce those features now if they move it to iCloud, right? So, could you just briefly highlight, because this stuff is all, you know, crazy to me, the uh, stock buybacks and the um, uh, dividend payments? Were those what people were expecting this quarter? Yeah, the, yeah. There's no change to the dividend. Um, the stock buyback, I miss. I sort of phased out there for some of the comments on the buyback, but they announced that they were going to do buyback. I think they said they finished. Uh, was it four million shares or something? Yeah, and then like nine that, million right? in the open market, I think. As yeah, well. so like it all sounds pretty much uh, as per plan. So the the last thing I kind of want to talk about because it's one of the most interesting things to me is Tim Cook's comments about iOS in the car. They asked him about it, and I'll just give you what he said first, and then I read like, your post, so I'm curious to talk. Yeah, I'm I would love to talk about this. So iOS in the car is interesting because, like as you know, you know BlackBerry owns Cunix now, and Cunix powers everything from nuclear reactors to low level functions in yeah. the car that mechanics use when you take it to the garage to service it. And Microsoft has you know Microsoft Sync, which is uh, Ford's version of Microsoft's embedded car system. Um, Android is being embedded everywhere, so it wouldn't surprise me if there's going to be Android uh, in the car. And Apple, instead of embedding, instead of becoming a local operating system, looks to be doing something like a bi-directional version of AirPlay, where you have your iOS device and you project it into a compatible car, the same way you project AirPlay content onto your TV through an Apple TV now. Yeah, um, so in a sense, then, Really, all they need to like so the let's say you're in a car that has uh, iOS in the car or whatever they're calling it. What is what's it called? Yeah, iOS, iOS in, in the car. iOS in the, oh, there we go. I had it right. Okay, yeah. so if I press the button on my steering wheel that you know lets me say Siri, you know, um, turn up the volume or whatever, it, I guess it's really sending that command to my iPhone iPhones up into the cloud uh, interpreting the command, or maybe it's a local command at that point, and then there's an API into the car's infotainment system. Mm -hmm. right? It's so, like a takeover play, basically. Yeah, so it's really just getting the car companies to implement some sort of API. It's not really an iOS installation in the car, is it? Or maybe no, it is. And with, no, there's no iOS in the car. And that kind of interesting to me because, you know, I bought a Toyota the year before they got their fancy smartphone system on Toyota. And I went back to them and I said, look, can we put this in my car? And they said, no, absolutely no way. You have to go to, you know, Best Buy and get a third party thing and use their stuff, or you have to buy a new car. And that's patently ridiculous. But oh, absolutely. I yeah. I mean, you look at the lifetime of uh, the, um, the life expectancy of a car versus that of a smartphone or any other electronics equipment. <laughs> yeah, it's ridiculous, but with iOS in the car, all they're doing is taking over your display. Like the same way Apple doesn't care what version of embedded Linux or Android runs your television set, they just take over the display. They're not going to care if QNX or Microsoft or nothing, you know, or embedded Linux runs your car. They're just going to take over the display and surface functionality for you. And that means anytime iOS gets upgraded or anytime you buy a new device, all the advantages of that software and hardware are just free for you. Your car just gets all that. Yeah, you would think. I mean, I guess there has to be something installed in the car itself, but that should be something that's just pure software and is updatable. Yeah, it's the same as your television. You wouldn't want to buy a new television just to upgrade it, but if you, you get the new Apple TV that makes it 1080p suddenly, or you get iOS 6 that suddenly do, does AirPlay mirroring, you've gotten a huge upgrade at no yeah. cost for the device that you're upgrading. 
Yeah, you know, it, that reminds me, um, I guess about a year or so ago, when people were still talking about Apple getting into the, dis the actual TV market for displays, and I thought, well, wouldn't it be cool if, you know, they build a display that's really super high quality, knowing that the, the display doesn't need to get changed very often, but things like ports and, and the... Um, Everything else, like the, the type of Wi-Fi used to connect in, all that other stuff that's relatively cheap compared to the display, is going to get transitioned out and bu build that into some kind of physical module that you can throw away and just slide in a new one when it comes out. Yeah, that, I mean, that was Guy English's model, too. He wanted a, a beautiful Apple display and a little box that all the wires went into that you could upgrade on its own and just yeah. be stuff for the TV. It just kind of makes sense. I and mean, it's totally off topic, but that's what it made me think of. Well, but I mean, I think it's on topic because I think when you look at AirPlay and Apple TV and you look at iOS and the car and the car, we start to see this vision of Apple's future. One of my big questions coming out of CES was, you know, how does Apple compete with LG and Samsung? Because they're starting to put Android in vacuum cleaners and stoves and refrigerators and because they make all these things and Apple does not. And Apple's also historically... Uh, will not license their OS to anybody else. So they wouldn't even make a deal with GE or some other company to put it into a competing fridge. But if you decouple software from hardware and suddenly you don't just have iOS in the car, but you have an iOS system that can, yeah. because iOS 7 is dynamic and it's objectified, you can suddenly start beaming that into anything that has a display. You know, if Apple decides to make those partnerships and suddenly I, Apple can take over anything without having to actually get into that business. Yeah, that's true. All they need to do is get the manufacturer to agree to install whatever is required, APIs or whatever. And that's hugely exciting to me because once you're in Apple's ecosystem, the downside is you don't get you know anything that's not in Apple's ecosystem. But if you can create a virtual ecosystem beyond the device that you buy, then suddenly your ability to have like a home to have you know connected home. If Apple's not doing it, it no longer means an iOS owner can't have it. Yeah, like. Um... Yeah, like um, it's it's sort of like an even better version of you know you get an iPhone or an iPod and there'd be the dock and you yeah. have to, if you bought a thing that had the dock connector you're good to go otherwise you're screwed and so those Bose sound stations and stuff that were pretty much really people only bought them because they had iPods and now it's like any stereo and you can do some kind of AirPlay or something like that with it. Yeah, so you imagine like GE doesn't have to make any license agreements, Apple doesn't have to make any license agreements, they just have to become an iOS in the blank or uh, an Air whatever blank uh, partner. Yeah. Same way printers, AirPrint has been doing that with printers now, where you just yeah. make your printer AirPrint compatible and suddenly any iOS device can use it. And I wonder if that's where we see the future of Apple and, you know, products beyond their slate of iOS devices. It may, You know, it makes sense that um, they would try to convince as many manufacturers as they can to support something like this because, you know, you've got more open standards like, um, is it DNLA? Uh, D yeah. yeah ugh, tongue twister. DNA there. and Miracast and all I sorts mean. of, yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, that's what you would expect guys like Android and BlackBerry will support. So if a manufacturer doesn't want to limit its opportunity to sell to more people, why would you why would you not you know listen to apple and say sure sure we'll build this technology in because you don't want to you don't want to alienate all the people who own iPads and iPhones and Macs and what's interesting want, to me is uh, if you listen to, to Phil Nickinson or Brian Klug on uh, Twitter, you know, they'll ask if Miracast has ever worked for anybody ever where AirPlay you know pretty much works for everybody all the time yeah exactly it's yeah yeah it's reliable it works and that's the value of you know uh, owning your own controlling everything yourself it's not an ecosystem but you know what i mean a proprietary interface yeah because absolutely. you get to control the whole darn thing you get to ensure sure the really experience works. for your customer yeah and i'm you know what i'm fine with that i mean i would much rather have something that works regularly and costs a bit more money than something that's totally flaky and requires me to go onto some forum and spend an hour debugging it yeah or call the kid over to get it to work for you program yeah. my vcr junior yeah, exactly. So, that yeah, it's absolutely truthful. I, I think that the whole iOS in the car, like when they announced that, when iOS 7 started, um, when the iOS 7 presentation was happening, I mean, we saw, how many logos did we see there? We saw pretty much everybody except yeah. the German vendors, right? Yeah, uh, and, you know, to Eddie Q's favor, there was Ferrari right on the top. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> so the, that's, uh, that's a lot of really interesting stuff.
So, Chris, um, I don't want to keep you too long, but can you give me sort of your grand sense of Apple in Q3 2013? What did you think of the results in general and the guidance that they gave for uh, Q4? Well, I mean, it sounds to me like everything is going more or less according to plan as for the guidance that, you know, they had laid out already and the guidance that they laid out now is, you know, reasonable considering that there are no new products. So I think it just shows you that, A, Apple's not going to grow forever without new products. And so there is some level of maturity happening here where people aren't just going to continue to flock into the store and buy more and more and more and more of this stuff without, you know, new products hitting. So they have to have new products uh, and that they, but they still have opportunity to grow because there's still opportunity to do distribution deals. We've got China mobile, we've got, you know, um, whatever. There's just, there's a lot yeah, of opportunity. Yeah, lower absolutely. Cost. So I Emerging think, markets. This, and, and of course, all the other stuff that we just talked about, like where is Apple going? We should we shouldn't just think of them as the company that sells iPhones and iPads and Macs. And we've got to think beyond that and wonder what's coming in 2014. It sounds like they have some, some plans. I will say, um, I didn't find Tim Cook nearly as congruent with his positive message as I did last quarter. So I'm not sure maybe he's just not feeling well or something. Well, but voice was a little bit gravelly this time too. Yeah, he just did. Yeah, exactly. His voice didn't sound quite. So I don't want to go and make a you know judgment call on it on just that one conference call. But they are clearly not seeing growth right now outside, at least outside the United States. But overall, as a company, they're not growing. That's undeniable. I think they can grow. I think we have to look at this way beyond a one quarter or even a one year thing because their product cycle is completely. Uh, not screwed up, but cha it's changed. Yeah. So a one-year comparison is not really that useful. We have to see what these guys can do. I still think that this is the company that is, um, it's the same, you know, Steve Jobs may be gone, but this is the same company producing excellent quality products with great user experiences. And I don't, I don't really see that changing. I see them continuing to gain market share. They continue to dominate tablets. They continue to dominate in the, uh, in the PC land. I think they're just going to continue to eat away as people migrate away from Microsoft and you know start looking more seriously at what could include Macs and the whole Apple ecosystem. It could also include Google and Chromebooks and all that kind of stuff. That's, like Microsoft seems to be the one that's losing. Google and Apple are winning. And I think that's going to keep going for several more years. And I think it's not a coincidence that those are the two um, most relentlessly fearless companies in tech right now. Yeah. Um, and I own them both. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a huge Google user, too. I think they're incredibly exciting. Chris, where can we find out more about you, and where can we read more of your stuff? More well, I I have uh, my blog is chrissymiastovsky.com. I don't write there that often, and uh, Twitter is where I hang out most of the time. And my handle is C and my last name, so C U Miastovsky. Perfect. And you you can find Chris writing for iMore, Android Central, CrackBerry, Windows Phone Central. Just look for his username. He is there all the time. You bet. Uh, you can find me at Renee Ritchie. You can find me at imore.com. You can find all of us at uh, mobilenations.com. And coming up next week on Talk Mobile, we're going to get a little bit more into the enterprise stuff because it is Enterprise and Security Week. So don't be surprised if we talk about a lot more of the stuff we mentioned about you know, growth and change in the enterprise next week extensively. Chris, thank you so much for joining me. I really appreciate it. My pleasure. And thank you to the chat room. Uh, you guys are amazing. I appreciate the stuff you put in there. And we will be back with our regular show on Thursdays. Have a great night, everybody.